Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, today I'm going to speak about performance analysis in the cloud, a reflective practitioner's perspective. Um, before I start, I assume that um, you guys know about what the cloud is and what performance generally means. But how many of you know about reflective practice or the ideas of reflection in action? Well, that's fine. Um, to introduce the idea of reflection in action, I want to first talk about an article written by the Danish astronomer Peter Nauer. He wrote an article called Programming as Theory Building. And in the article, he emphasizes that um, programming should not be viewed as an activity which, whose sole purpose is the production of a program text. Instead, programming should be viewed as a process um, where a programmer or a team of programmers build an insight or a theory about an external reality which they convert into symbols of the choice of their programming language. One of the merits of such an approach to programming is that when it comes to modifying the program, um, during that time, the changes that are happening in the external reality, the programmer can see the similarities with those changes with the theory of the symbols that he's using, and so he can accommodate those changes easily. Now, I want to use this idea as it is and think about performance analysis in the same way. And thankfully, there's a framework of reflective practice which uh, Donald Shun wrote about in his book called The Reflective Practitioner, How Professionals Think in Action. Now, in this book, um, Donald Shun took ideas from many diverse fields like architecture, town planning, um, science-based professions, and engineering, and he tried to come up with what really does it mean to have a professional practice. So, I was, of course, very excited about uh, making this proposal to Froscon, and thanks to them for accepting this. But I was very nervous as well uh, when I was writing the uh, proposal description. But I recently read another book uh, called The New ABCs of Research by Ben Schneiderman. Um, how many of you know who Ben Schneiderman is? Cool. <laughs> OK, for those of you who do not know, uh, Ben Schneiderman, OK, how many of you know what a tree map is? Cool. And what a clickable hyperlink is. <laughs> so Ben Schneiderman uh, created the clickable hyperlink. He's very influential in the fields of design and human-computer interaction, as well as information visualization. So he writes in his book, The New ABCs of Research, that the design community celebrates Donald Schoen's book for its illuminating discussion about creative problem solving by experienced professionals. So this gave me uh, quite a boost to think about my talk uh, more. And with that, uh, I'm going to describe reflection in action. Uh, this will be a more textual description what's going to follow in the form of tables. I hope to convey you the ideas throughout as the talk progresses. So reflection in action was a view of professional practice. And Donald Schoen compared uh, reflection in action with a conventional school of thought called technical rationality, which followed the positivist view of uh, professional practice. In the conventional view, uh, means and ends were considered completely separate, and problem solving was quite simply the use of a procedure to achieve a predefined objective. In reflection in action, means and ends are, inter are framed interdependently, and the focus or the central idea is to set a problem or frame a problem on a situation in which the practitioner thinks about. In the conventional view of thought, research and practice have very clear boundaries, and practice becomes the application of research-based theories which are highly objective and are uh, based on controlled experiment, whereas in reflection in action, practice becomes a kind of research, and the practitioner conducts a reflect reflective conversation with the situation, which also involves experiments which are rigorous, similarly rigorous as the uh, research-based or the technical rationality view of, uh, of research, um, but they are on-the-spot experiments within the frame that the practitioner imposes on a situation. 
Lastly, knowing and doing are inseparable in reflection in action. Once again, in the conventional view of thought, action just becomes implementation or a test of technical decision. Now, earlier I had a couple of examples from the book, but I had to remove those uh, so that um, we can put all of this uh, directly in the framework of performance, uh, performance analysis. So with that, um, I want to mention something that uh, Donald Schoen writes in the chapter on engineering sciences. He writes about an article which was written by Harvey Brooks in 1967. Harvey Brooks was at Harvard during that time. And Harvey Brooks described the difficult situation of a practicing engineer who has to, or who is expected to bridge the rapidly changing body of knowledge of whatever his science or chosen engineering field was with the expectations of society. Keep in mind that this was written in 1967, as well as consider the use of the word bridge in this uh, slide, because I'm going to come back to this. Um, I believe that we are still, we are exactly in this situation for uh, people who are working in this field, and especially in a cloud-based environment. Um, let's consider what roles exist today in a modern organization. We have developers or system engineers or data scientists, and then we have team leads of the teams of such developers or data scientists or system engineers. Then you have managers of such teams, then you have managers of managers, and you have many other roles in between. And then there's the cloud. What unites all of these when it comes to their thoughts about the cloud? And before I carry on, how many of you guys actually um, work in IT? And okay, cool. So what unites all of them, or what's common to all of them, is what they speculate about the cloud. And on average, that speculation tends to be along the lines of that everything needs to be fully functional out of the box, and it needs to, it needs to be more economical compared to other alternatives. The speculation is fine. I think all of us do that to an extent. But when those speculations start manifesting as expectations, that's, why, that's when uh, things can happen. And now I want to go back to the earlier slide where I have underlined the word bridge. I believe that the metaphor of bridge no longer holds in such an environment because I believe that some of these bridges are burning faster than they are being built. And so that's where a framework of reflection in action can help or benefit quite a bit uh, to navigate such an environment. I was lucky or fortunate to be able to cross some of these bridges, and that's why I'm here today to share some of the things that I learned and hopefully help you in your process of discovery and experiment. The very first thing that we need to consider is performance modeling. This is the frame that a performance analyst brings to an environment, and this is the frame in which, or this is the frame which enables any kind of experimentation or problem solving um, in a cloud environment. So problem solving is part of reflection in action, but it becomes the part of the overall experiment which is carried out with a particular frame. Now, in the morning, I was a bit sad because I noticed that uh, this time around, the t-shirts uh, at the conference are not being uh, given early in the morning. Instead, they are being, uh, you'll get those around noon. However, that was really good because uh, my example about uh, some ideas of queuing theory are going to be based on uh, the T-shirt counter at Frostcon. I, pref I actually prefer the cold brew counter because I don't get this, this cold brew anywhere. So this is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, that's the context of an example I'm going to give. In reflection in action, the frame is informed by certain guiding principles or overarching theory or the appreciative system of the practitioner. And in 
case of performance analysis and performance modeling specifically, those guiding principles are queuing theory and statistics and data analysis. Just keep in mind that what I'm going to present now, it's more as a technician of queues and not a mathematician. This is in equal parts an, admit, an admittance of a weakness, but also an expression of wonder. So keep that view in mind and let's have some fun. Oh, well, not with those, but. So let's see what a queue actually is, um, or what does a queuing center mean? And keep in mind that now we are thinking about the t-shirt counter um, at Frostcon. So at the t-shirt counter, there's a helper or a volunteer who is servicing participants in the conference by giving out t-shirts. Um, so now, now that the t-shirts are only being uh, given at, starting, from, starting at noon, we can expect a queue of participants at the counter. Um, so participants come and maybe they have to wait because there might be other participants waiting to get their t-shirts. And of course, all of them would leave uh, the counter at some point, hopefully with a t-shirt. So this forms the queue. Um, the queue actually includes the participant who is being served right now, as well as the ones who are waiting. When queuing theory as a discipline uh, was maturing, um, a notation was introduced for understanding the different kinds of queues. We're gonna take one example of the MM1 queue. This is considered as to be one of the more uh, simpler models of queues. And in the notation, the first letter represents the arrival distribution. In our case, that would be the arrivals of the incoming participants to the t-shirt counter. The second one is the service distribution. And lastly, the number of servers, or in our case, the Frostcon helpers who are um, giving out the t-shirts. There are a few statistical assumptions uh, in this, but the one which is really important to keep in mind throughout is that we are talking about average quantities. With that, let's just take a look at some queuing metrics. Um, one thing I wanna mention at this point is that in reflection in action, um, there always is a medium in which the practitioner thinks about whatever he's doing. So in architecture, that could be a sketch pad. Well, today it might be software, but um, in a sketch pad, the practitioner can um, experiment with the designs that the, a building should have, where its location should be relative to other parts of the overall architecture and things like that. For queuing uh, or for performance analysis, a medium, a very nice medium to think about such things is a software called PDQ, and we'll learn more about this. Some, some of the metrics which are very important, uh, actually these are the most important metrics, are the arrival rate, the service time. Service time is how long a helper takes to actually give out a t-shirt, so they have to find the t-shirt, they have to collect the money, maybe give some change back. Doing this for a customer on average is what the service time of the helper is, uh, giving out a t-shirt. Um, then there are a couple of other ones. The response time is a very well-known metric. We'll see more about this. Then there's utilization. How you, well, in case of um, computer systems utilization, a very simple example is CPU, for example. How utilize the CPU while serving certain requests? And queue length, of course, it's one of the primary metrics that we think about. Once again, keep in mind, we're talking about average quantities. This is a very important assumption whenever working with this, um, whenever working with queuing, queuing models um, generally. So a uh, very quick example. Think about uh, the inputs for a queue. Uh, we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna use mathematical formulae to do this by hand first, and then I'll show you how PDQ approaches this. Consider the arrival rate of the participants at the t-shirt counter as being 0.75. This is simplified so that the calculation becomes easier. Consider also that on average, the helper takes about a minute to serve uh, a participant. What we can expect as the outputs of 
just the, these two inputs to a queuing model are three metrics. Uh, the first one is utilization, and the calculated value can be obtained by arrival rate multiplied by the service time, and in this case, that happens to be 0.75. The response time after using that formula, it comes, to, it comes to be four. So four minutes on average is the response time when there's a queue and um, that's uh, that. And I think that might increase when they actually open, the, when they start giving out the t-shirts. And finally, the queue length um, is arrival rate times the response time, and that's three. So this is just to give you an idea that you can calculate this by hand uh, for a very simple queue like the MM1 queue that I just showed you. Let's see how PDQ does this. So how many of you are aware of the R language? Cool, so the example is uh, based, or it uses the R library, the PDQ library in R. So Let's take a look at how it looks like. Yeah. Cool. Um, at the back. Cool. So um, let's do a very quick walkthrough through uh, this. The very first thing we do is um, we load the library PDQ. We initialize the arrival rate of the participants and the service time of the helper. Um, now we actually start initializing the model parameters. So to initialize, we call our queuing center as the Froscorn t-shirt counter. So we initialize that. Um, we can set an optional comment that this is the model of an MM1 queue at the Froscorn t-shirt counter. We define our queuing center in terms of who is going to serve uh, the participants. In our case, that's a Froscorn helper or a volunteer. And then we define our workload. Um, we call the workload get a t-shirt, and the workload is characterized by the arrival rate of the participants, which was 0.75. Um, optionally, we can set the uh, work unit. So in this case, the work unit is participants. If this was an application that you were developing, that would be how many requests it, it can handle, so requests per second or something like that. Uh, Time unit is minutes. Then we characterize the service demand of the helper himself or herself uh, in terms of the workload, which is get a t-shirt, and how long it takes to serve on average one uh, participant. With just these two inputs, we can solve the model just like we did, but let's see how PDQ does. In PDQ, the method to use is solve, and then we get a report. So let's see what kind of report PDQ generates. So let's see how the PDQ report actually looks like. So we are developing a model for the Frostcon t-shirt counter, and for our own reference, we know that we are doing uh, a model of the MM1 queue at the t-shirt counter. Then we define our inputs. Our workload parameters is basically uh, what kind of arrival rate is there, what's the workload we are characterizing, and what's the service demand. So that's in this section of the PDQ model. And then finally, when we actually solve the, uh, or invoke the solve uh, function, we get the outputs, so we can see the system performance and the resource performance. The system performance um, con includes things like the number and system. This is the queue length that I mentioned briefly. Uh, so this says, on average, there are about three participants in the queue who want a t-shirt or are already getting a t-shirt. The throughput of the helper is about 0.75, this is, as you might have noticed, similar, same as the arrival rate. In this case, um, the average response time is about four minutes. Now let's take a look at the resource performance. So this is about the helper. Um, 
and for the workload, get a T-shirt, the helper is about 75% utilized. It doesn't make sense, but think about if this was an application. I, in, in, this, in that case, it would be a server utilization that we'll be talking about. But these are some of the parameters uh, which define the resource performance. So that's a very brief demo of what PDQ can do now. You might think, well, if we can already do this by hand, what's the need for things like PDQ? Um, now imagine that FrostCon is actually a flow of participants, organizers, speakers who are coming in and out of the halls the and the counters at the dev rooms. If we were to characterize the queuing uh, nature of all the counters or maybe even the rooms, that would be almost impossible to solve by hand. And that's where PDQ comes in for doing, uh, or taking a, takes, PDQ takes an analytical approach towards this. And in fact, uh, PDQ stands for pretty damn quick. So it does that computation quite fast. And that's, so think about FrostCon as a network of queues. That's where analytical tools uh, like PDQ are quite important. And in fact, indispensable for doing any meaningful performance analysis. So that's a bit of a, theory, a bit, bit of theory and example. Um, we are now going to go into how this looks like in a production environment, which is based on the cloud in AWS. But before I carry on, any questions so far? All right, cool. Um, so consider a Java application running on multiple EC2 instances, which receive requests via a load balancer. The EC2 instances are part of an auto-scaling group, uh, which dynamically scales the instances based on their average CPU utilization. If we take a closer look at the application, a request comes in, and the Apache web server does some pre-processing of the request, sends it to the Tomcat application server, where the application code is also deployed, and the application sends out further requests to some external services. The external services reply back with a few responses. The application does some actual business processing, business logic processing, and sends out a few responses out, or sends the response out to the user. Let's pause here for a second and consider the amount of data you have if you were to think about performance um, of this particular application. So you have not less than 50 to 100 metrics just within the scope of the architecture, very simplified architecture that I have showed you. At the load balancer level, there are at least about 10 metrics that you can use. There are metrics at the auto-scaling group level, then there are metrics at EC2 instance level, of course at the Apache web server, Tomcat, and finally the application instrumentation itself, which might be within itself about 100 or more metrics. Let's not forget the operating system as well. So, with that amount of data and that amount of metrics, where do you actually start looking at if you want to come up with a capacity model for your application? Well, a lot of you might already, be, already have uh, time series dashboards like these, perhaps even more complicated than these. However, this is not useful to be able to analyze the performance of a system. Let's consider some of the, or let's consider the most important performance metrics uh, to characterize uh, the performance of an application. Some of the, two of the well-known or popular metrics are throughput and response time. Throughput means uh, how many requests the application can handle in a given period of time. Response time is on average how long it takes to serve or yeah, serve those requests. Equally important, in fact, I consider these to be the more important uh, derived performance metrics, which are given by a very important law called the Little's Law. This gives us uh, the number of concurrent requests, which is the product of the throughput and response time. And the second uh, law, and the second uh, version of the law is, uh, it relates utilization as the product of the throughput and the service time. However, we are going to consider the service time from this. So service time can be described as utilization over throughput. Why are these derived performance metrics more important? Because these actually express the relationships between the metrics, and it's those relationships which determine how you should plan for your capacity. So from a speculation about 
that amount of data or metrics available to understand the performance of your application, which, by the way, might be running globally in multiple AWS regions and data centers. Out of all of that, we come down to just about a handful of metrics. These ones are the measured throughput, the measured concurrency, the estimated service time, the measured response time, and the measured utilization. To get to these metrics, I have, uh, as a reference, there's a slide deck at the end of the presentation. You can refer to that, because that tells you the internals of Tomcat, how you can get some of these metrics. So that was the data collection or data gathering part. Now, how do you actually model that to understand the performance or the capacity of your system? First of all, we need to take a time-independent view here. Uh, we need to consider the steady state of the application. So we cannot have variations in the application while we are collecting all this data. That's why time series doesn't work for performance analysis. We need time-independent view. Now, within the frame of queuing theory, uh, we can expect that a throughput curve look like this, having a concave shape compared to the user load and the response time to look like a hockey stick handle where it increases, almost, it increases linearly with the user load. One thing I forgot to mention is that now we are discussing a completely different model than what I showed before. So that was the example, very basic example of an MM1Q, but this, these models are completely different. So we had some data to start with. This is a scatter plot of data that I collected in July 2016. On the y-axis, you'd see the throughput. On the y-axis, on the x-axis, is the number of concurrent users. After we actually did the modeling, we, the blue line here represents uh, outputs from the PDQ model. And we can see that, visually at least, that the model seems to do a good job of explaining the performance characteristics of the application. When we actually started evaluating the model, uh, of course it looked good visually, but there's a technique called uh, dummy queues in PDQ, and we used about 350 of those to come up with the right values of certain parameters. So the question at that point became, well, what do these dummy queues represent? Is there some sort of parallelism in the application, or does this describe some kind of polling behavior? A few months passed, and I collected some more data, and what happened was the new data actually broke the model completely. So we had to do something here. After we adjusted the model, some, very, uh, some key differences uh, that we had to make to the model were that the service time initially was based on the CPU utilization or the CPU time and that was about a millisecond or so. In the new model, instead of modeling the CPU as the resource or the server, in, in, or characterizing the server, if you remember the diagram before, instead of that, we were now modeling Tomcat threads themselves. And so the service time was now characterizing the service time of, on average, of a Tomcat thread uh, which serves an HTTP request. Of course, we had to validate this data, this model as well. So we used uh, the data, and we can see that from the adjusted uh, PDQ model, the uh, data does conform to the model. And so this uh, was, this validated the use of that model. Now, once again, talking about talking about reflection in action, right? This was an introduction to the frame of queuing theory that you can use when doing performance analysis in the cloud or otherwise. But problem solving, as I mentioned, is still part of the overall experiment or the overall frame. And these experiments are not less rigorous than some of the controlled experiments that, ha that happen in research. So to be able to do that, we need some on-the-spot experiments, and in this case, uh, I'm talking about the spot offering from AWS as well. How many of you know about spot? 
So Spot uh, is an offering, very nice offering from AWS. Uh, it has a few nice properties that you can save up to 90% compared to the on-demand price uh, that AWS has. However, to be able to save that kind of money, you need to improve your chances of getting an instance in the first place. And you can do that by diversifying the uh, diversifying your kind of instances across availability zones, their types and their sizes. Just, in, just as an example, you might have tested your application on an M4 10x large instance with many number of CPU cores, but the market might just only have M4 2x large instances during a specific time, so what do you do during that time? So you need to be able to reconfigure your application, consider all of these when you want to roll this thing out. The other nice thing about AWS Spot is that you can use uh, auto-scaling directly with Spot, uh, and it's now very seamless. However, the usual metrics that are the more common metrics of CPU utilization, latency, throughput, they no longer work. Because if you have an instance which has about 40 cores and you have an instance which just has four cores, the average CPU utilization is completely bad for such an envi heterogeneous environment. At this time, what you can do is uh, you can use the number of concurrent requests. As I mentioned before, uh, Little's law or concurrency, this gives us the relationship between the performance metrics, and that's why you already know what kind of behavior to expect if you use N or the number of concurrent requests as the metric. The CPU latency and throughput metrics are more reactive metrics. So this was a very... Uh, Good example of a rigorous on-the-spot experiment, which was informed by some guiding principles from queuing theory, and the enterprise benefited by saving costs, their operating costs of a very huge uh, infrastructure. Of course, we had to still test our model uh, with the new data after we made these changes, and it did conform to the model, so that was uh, validated as well. And this is uh, from very recent data, about March this year, so um, the new model that we came up with worked for all the data. All the so one thing we can appreciate here is that, uh, or you have to keep in mind, is that the application was going through many architectural changes, release cycles, all sorts of changes are happening. And that's what makes it important that a performance analyst has a frame in which he can think or accommodate these changes. And that's where I think reflection in action can be very indispensable for to be able to navigate such an enterprise. Let's take another example. Or oh, before this, uh, any questions so far? Let's take another example of disk utilization. Now, everybody says that storage is cheap, or everybody knows that storage is cheap and it's fast, but managing disks is still far from being easy. Um, let's take examples of two very popular uh, software, Kafka and Graphite. Uh, these uh, anecdotes are slightly different from what I've been talking about so far, and we'll see how they are different. The first point of difference, which I can mention already, is that this um, involved interaction with AWS quite a lot. So this had feedback from AWS team on possible um, uh, reasons for some of the behavior that we were seeing. So in a large infrastructure, if you're using a central metric system or hosting your own central metric system, it becomes very important that you do proper capacity planning for that itself because of the number of metrics that you might have to deal with today in a modern enterprise with microservices, with hybrid environment, environments, with the cloud, and perhaps on-premise, or all sorts of uh, variations on this. It becomes important to, to be able to uh, plan for the capacity. In this case, we are going to talk about the disks because uh, all of that time series data is lying on many disks. Um, what was interesting in this example was that, or in this case was that, the performance issue was discovered during the process of data collection itself. So we, before we could even think about modeling, within uh, we discovered certain things during the data collection itself. 
what I observed was that the EBS volumes, um, just so you know, EBS is uh, the storage offering from AWS. These uh, get attached to your instance. What I observed was that these EBS volumes were getting less IOPS, which is a measure of throughput, compared to what they were capable of. So the question was, where, are, where is all the throughput going? Why are we not getting the promised uh, performance? There were many investigations carried out by AWS and myself. Um, I shared uh, dashboards that I had for our infrastructure. From their side, also, they tried to share something that the view that they had or that particular engineer had. What we found out was, after many of these uh, conversations, that the volume or the activity was actually being throttled. However, this was not transparent to us at all, or not easily, because this required the engineer to point out, and he also had to investigate on the AWS side to figure out what was really happening. And the reason for throttling was, uh, on the operating system level, we, we saw that IOSTAT was showing that the writes per second is very high. Um, what we did then, or what was suggested by AWS was that we should configure the application to reduce that activity. So I did that, and it did uh, stabilize the behavior of Graphite, but this seemed like a compromise um, because we were still not getting the performance that the volume was capable of. So this pointed out questions about the architecture of Graphite itself and how EBS works, and that takes me to another point in reflection in action, which is, as I said, it's not always about problem solving, but once you have pursued a line of thought in your frame, it should open up a further line of inquiry. It is not supposed to end a particular investigation or so, it should always open a further line of inquiry, and that's what happened in this case, that we figured out, well, you know, we need to do this for Graphite, it's not ideal, but at least Graphite provided that those uh, knobs. Uh, maybe if this was some other application, we might not have been that lucky. So this sort of signifies uh, that we should ask the right questions to your cloud vendor um, to get the right information. The other example was about uh, Kafka. Um, once again, now, I was considering queuing theory as the guiding principle, and what I set out to do was to collect metrics um, uh, which, which would help predicting the disk usage, because one thing that modeling is done for is actually to predict the how your application would behave with changes in the workload that it handles. So that's very central to the idea of modeling, and based on that guiding principle, I thought of getting some data for uh, predicting disk usage of Kafka. However, when I did collect the data, it did not make much sense. On the one hand, there were metrics from EBS volumes, like uh, queue length, throughput, and latency, which to me sounded so um, encouraging because uh, I thought this is just gonna work out, out of the box and we could predict disk usage quite easily. But comparing what, uh, uh, comparing the metrics from EBS side with the operating system level metrics, and then to figure out um, one of the very important metrics uh, to uh, characterize a queue is the service time. If we cannot find the service time of an application, we cannot do queuing models at all. Now in case of Linux, um, in the man page for IOSTAT, we see that uh, for the service time field, that uh, warning, do not trust this field anymore, this will be removed in a future version. With that kind of um, ambiguity about the metric and the lack of congruence between the operating system metrics and the EBS metrics, it was next, I mean, for me at least, it was, pretty, it was becoming quite hard to be able to do this uh, in a meaningful manner. So I started talking with the AWS engineers and this was a very different uh, suggestion. So instead of trying to validate uh, the modeling techniques that I was trying to use, one of the suggestions that uh, AWS team had was that in, instead of doing that, uh, use uh, statistical methods like linear regression. 
So that, once again, is sort of a, different, an, a new line of inquiry that triggered us on, and from there we try to predict the disk usage of Kafka. The uh, next thing we're going to talk about is uh, serverless applications, and we'll co uh, we're going to focus on the concurrency part of serverless applications. This is, once again, a different example from the previous ones, but the idea of concurrency is central to pretty much all of them. So how many of you have actually used serverless architecture or Lambda functions in AWS? Nice. Um, in Lambda, or serverless uh, offering that AWS provides, what does concurrency even mean, right? So, the invocation of a Lambda function is a basic unit of concurrency that you think about the concurrency in terms of the number of invocations of the function. Lambda requires you to specify the memory, and AWS figures out the appropriate CPU accordingly. <laughs> in some sense, this does sound to me like the Lambda function acts like a server in the queuing theory sense, um, but that's just in some sense um, I haven't pursue that line of thought much further. So it, in Lambda, concurrency uh, can be represented as events per second times the function duration, and this is exactly the form of Little's law. So Little's law is not uh, native to queuing theory. In fact, it's actually very generally applicable to a host of uh, fields. Uh, very uh, prominent field is the field of operations research where Little's law is quite well known. However, to me, I jumped off my feet when I saw that this is exactly the form of, a, of Little's Law, and this informed my ideas about how best to program a particular uh, task that I was doing, which involved uh, copying of a large number of files from one S3 bucket to another bucket over the network. So during that time, I had to figure out how to measure the concurrency. Um, there are no out-of-the-box uh, ways to do this, as far as, uh, when, at least when I did this. Uh, what you, so you have to instrument your code to calculate the correct events rate. Uh, events are basically what trigger your Lambda function. So you have to figure out what's the rate of these events. As a, and there's a reference at the end of the presentation you can use to calculate that. By default, uh, it's limited to about ten, uh, 1,000 concurrent executions. After that, throttling kicks in. And throttling could also be, in some sense, considered to be a queuing uh, uh, mechaniz mechanism because, in a way, based on the incoming events, your Lambda function is not being invoked uh, for all of them. So AWS throttles you after about 1,000 concurrent executions by default. So with such a, with, in such a scenario, how do you uh, come up with an optimal concurrency approach? What I ended up doing was to use a mix of threads and lambdas in different environments. So from our on-premise instance, I had a piece of code which uh, was based on threads. In the, uh, we were using Python at the time. And on the lambda side, uh, Earlier, there was just threads and lambdas, so the threads used to call lambda functions, and that was it. But then what I found out was, even within a lambda, you can make the processing faster by having threads inside the lambda. So it was overall um, a mix of approaches, and um, there's uh, a reference for this as well if you want more details. The next one is a slightly different. Uh, but this is also one of the elements of the frame because monitoring, even though it's central uh, for doing operations, we need a new idea of monitoring when it comes to the cloud. Now, there was a media theorist, American media theorist, by the name of Marshall McLuhan. He came up with the phrase, the medium is the message. Actually, when the book came out, uh, that phrase was accidentally changed to the medium is the massage. And we kind of see this. Uh, in the operations teams these days because once you see that some of your mon um, um, monitors don't work as expected, there's a tendency to just let it be and repeat the same things that you have been doing, follow a runbook or something like that. 
remove some files from the temporary folder so that there's more disk space, things like that. However, in the cloud, that doesn't really work for long. What is required is to think about the medium um, with more uh, focus. As a very uh, simple example of the kind of differences that the cloud has compared uh, to other environments, let's consider the use of notebooks versus dashboards. How many of you know the general idea of notebooks? Well, if you, um, maybe I can show you very quickly. Um, if we use um, R as an example, we have the option to create an R notebook. It allows you to um, have pieces of code with certain documentation or other things that can insert the notebook. It becomes kind of a, for the lack of a better word, narrative. You can um, think about uh, what you're doing, run it by others, sort of discuss around these ideas. And in this case, for example, we could, so that's uh, one. Um, we could add another section to this and say just um, let's see so I'm not sure if this is going to load the okay so let's say we are a team of well in this case um, statisticians and I want to share a scatter plot of data with you and I mean you, if you're at my desk and we start talking about this. After that, I just want to print a string. Let's say, yeah, so it prints a string. You can go on like this. In a dashboard, uh, you would have, you would already have a plot, so to say, or many plots. And to make changes, you will have to sort of take it offline in the sense when you're editing it, you can no longer discuss the ideas that you're trying to do with the person who is at your desk. Now. In case of monitoring in the cloud, this becomes very important because due to the dynamic nature of the cloud, you cannot call meetings for all the things that might be breaking all the time. You need, if, if, if a group of software engineers come to your uh, desk and you want to quickly discuss or brainstorm a few ideas on why their application might be behaving in a certain way, notebooks are much better for that kind of thing. So that for me, it kind of reflects the change of thinking that's required when considering monitoring in the cloud. Um, I have uh, uh, more examples, and these are some uh, things which I learned, some of these the hard way, and this is about we need better metrics to start with and also better programming language support for coming up with uh, good monitoring and to be able to calculate or find all the performance metrics. The very first thing I noticed is that when it comes to uh, manipulating metrics or instrumenting your code, I was very surprised that Python did not have as strong a library as Java has in terms of JMX, like Java has JMX. Um, and it's so uh, comprehensive that I did not have to spend too long to use that interface uh, in the Tomcat application I showed you before. Whereas in Python, I couldn't find a solid stable library which had similar interfaces, and that was, uh, so that's why I had to manually instrument a bit of Python code, and luckily that worked, but I wasn't sure if I could do that again for other things. Um, the second example is of monitoring Tomcat. Um, a very common uh, way of thinking or way of um, approaching Tomcat's monitoring of performances in terms of number of busy threads. In reality, that's a lot less significant that, than the number of threads which are actually serving requests. These are the threads which are in the service stage, and if you remember the model that I showed you before, they are the ones which are actually servicing requests, and that number is not the same as the number of busy threads, and this becomes very important while doing the modeling, and this is not even easy to obtain, so there's no direct metric for this that Tomcat exposes. You have to write your own script or a program to fetch this metric. Lastly, I want to, um, as I mentioned, that um, anything in reflection, in action, any um, hypothesis or experiment that you're doing, it should lead you to a further line of inquiry. And in my case, that was 
quite literally to find out where are all the queues forming in the whole environment, in the operating system, in the cloud, components in between. One example I want to share is that we were, uh, for our data pipeline, we were seeing a lot of delays in the processing and transfer of data. And that was because um, we saw at the operating system level that the send queue values in Netstat were so high for a long period of time, and that's why the transfers were not even taking place for a particular period of time. This one required even more conversations and discussions with the AWS team. I think this extended over months. And by the end of it, uh, not only we had to change the application code, but also the S3 SDK code with, of course, a lot of uh, rules of thumb and best practices and general ideas being shared uh, across both sides. But this sort of tells you that if you take this into account uh, in your application design and application architecture, what I'm saying is performance analysis, if you make that as part of a first-class citizen of your application design, some of these things can be considered from the very beginning. This is more of a quiz time when it comes to data visualization, but before that, uh, are there any questions? Okay. So, the quiz is like this. Um, how many data stores do you know? MySQL, Postgres, Kafka, so between three and five? Between one and three? <laughs> Okay, between three and five, or one and three? Good. Um, and keep in mind how many of all you, you actually use in your work as well, so if you have production use, that's even more important. So that's just the data stores. How many web servers do you know of? So Apache, Nginx, uh, many little web servers, uh, spec application-specific web servers, so I guess still around three or five, between that window, three or five. How many programming languages do you know? <laughs> More than 10, 20? It's a huge number, right? Um, and how many cloud vendors do you know? Or um, IT infrastructure hosting providers do you know? What I'm trying to get at is think about the one developer or the one system engineer who is supposed, or it's very likely that it's the system engineer's job, Think about the system engineer who has to make sure that all of these systems are always up and running and performing well. What I'm trying to get at is all of these, let's consider the data stores, for example. Um, the data stores, uh, most of them actually come up with some kind of management interfaces, like uh, they expose some monitoring data with their own dashboards. And similarly, um, some of the web servers, they also expose their own metrics, might have dashboards of their own. Um, what I have found out is at least that not one of, or let me ask this as a question, how many of those do you think um, follow strong visualization principles when it comes to conveying that information, which they think is important to run their application, but they're not thinking, from what I think, they're not thinking about that one guy, one system engineer who is looking at all of that. Well, it, of course, it's a team of those guys, but they are still, you, you guys know about the idea of on-call, right? We rotate and we, f we have to keep the systems always up and running. I believe that, for me at least, this is a much more important line. It's, it's an equally important line of inquiry for all of us that we need to have, uh, instead, well, DevOps, SREs, that's all good. But I think the next uh, phase for that should be visualization informed operations or development. And right now, if I, comp I cannot show the data stores, but what I remember is um, two very important uh, or very popular uh, enterprise ready, business high performance, all of that, two data stores. One of them showed data just for the last 10 minutes, which is fine, but the other data store shows it for a longer time, but doesn't show you the metrics which make sense from a performance perspective. So pretty much what I'm trying to say is pretty much all of them want you to interpret their metrics in a terminology that they have invented, 
And that's what makes it a lot harder for a performance analyst to be able to correlate all that, even if, as I said, the, some of these bridges are burning faster than they are being built. So even if you can, it's not always possible to make sense of all the data out there. And yeah, I think that was the last note. Um, uh, some references. Um, so a lot of the performance modeling stuff I learned from Dr. Neil Gunther. Um, he runs his own company. I can highly recommend his classes. Um, then the couple of links I shared before, uh, they're part of the slide deck, which I'll upload on FrostCon portal. And so we can have some Q&A right now. How many of you are actually uh, running production workloads in the cloud? Cool. All right, I guess then that's it. Uh, thanks a lot for your time, and hopefully see you next year. <laughs>